Hello everyone. Let us look at how light can be used for sensing. This is a very familiar topic. So, you can sense you know whatever you want using light because light matter interaction is very strong. For example, whether there is an object present there or not, you can sense using uh, light and you can sense the color of that object and you can sense what is this object made of. So, you chemically you can uh, probe, physically you can probe. So, and also you know uh, the, the shapes uh, that any object is. So, uh, optics or photonics has this uh, really powerful um, light matter interaction uh, that can give you variety of information that you want to uh, get out of any uh, matter that you are interested in. We use it every day. For example, you are using camera and this camera is nothing but a light sensor. So, it senses the photon and in particular it can sense the color of the photon and also you have optoelectronic uh, uh, devices that can also can emit certain color based on uh, the information that you give into this device. And there are a lot of spectroscopy techniques that relies on light matter interaction. So, sensing is very fundamental to light matter interaction. So, it, you can do a lot of interesting things, but when it comes to integrated optics, you know the field is very large. You perhaps we could have one full you know 8 week course uh, on this uh, optical sensing alone, but since we have to you know reduce our scope to how we can exploit the photonic circuit for light matter interaction, we are going to look at you know two example uh, uh, here as a case study on how we could exploit the guided wave system right, that is photonic integrated circuit for sensing. So, even sensing here you know sounds very broad right. So, what are we going to sense? So, you have a light beam that is propagating through the waveguide and as we all know that this guiding is, is, uh, is controlled or determined by the material that you have as a waveguide and also the environment around it. Right? So, we have the refractive index uh, when I say environment it is about the refractive index that is surrounding and when there is a change in the refractive index uh, in, the, in the environment the light will actually sense this environmental change. Right? How do we sense it? This is the n effective or the propagation constant will change because you are changing the environment now. So, now all your you know waveguide when you go back to your waveguide design we, we talked about n 1, n 2, n 3 right. So, n 3 is the, the light that is uh, uh, the light that is interacting with the top uh, cladding right. So, the, the top cover and if you are going to change this n 3 then your guiding condition itself is going to change that means your beta is going to change and we, we can actually measure it. So, we can measure those changes and similarly when the light is propagating through the waveguide you can have you know light that is extending itself out right. So, there is a the evanescent tail that you have outside the waveguide. So, again going back to our basic understanding of waveguide design. So, you do have uh, exponentially decaying solution outside your waveguide right. So, you have very strong electric field outside. So, that field is actually probing the environment what is happening there and when you when you say there is a change in the environment right it could be in two ways one is the density change and it could be also absorption change. So, the environment is characterized by the refractive index right. So, you have n and then k. So, you could have absorption because of this. So, when you have absorption then eventually that is going to affect the light propagation. How? It is not going to directly affect our beta, but it is going to affect the intensity of light that is propagating through light will be absorbed by this medium that is surrounding 
So, we can measure the density and we can also measure the absorption around the, the waveguide right in the environment. So, these are all very fundamental ways of using it, very simple ways of using this. And there are other techniques like you can do on chip spectroscopy for example, you can do um, on chip fluorescence. So, you can have fluorescent molecules sitting on the waveguides and you can excite those wave, uh, fluorescent molecules using the waveguide. So, the light could excite the molecules sitting on the waveguide and then once you have excitation you will have emission and this emission can be isotropic right. So, the emission normally is an isotropic. So, you can collect this light either from the top or even with the waveguide. So, this becomes a spectroscopy. So, using waveguide uh, enhanced spectroscopy you can do. So, these are all different ways of you know exploiting light guiding in a in a guided wave system right for various sensing applications. So, since we do not have you know a lot of time to go about talking about this in interesting field of uh, sensing on chip, we are going to pick up you know simple examples and that is good enough for you to get motivated. So, how one can easily use this concepts that we already learned throughout this uh, course and use it for something very applied ok. So, we are going to look at two different things here ok. So, let us jump into that. So, what can we do for this uh, sensing? So, there are two ways right. So, as I mentioned you can do um, refractive index sensing. So, that is the change in the uh, refractive index right. So, how can we sense that and next is the absorption sensing. So, the refractive index sensing is uh, rather straightforward right. So, you have a certain uh, medium right. So, you could have uh, for example, in this case this is a, a fiber Bragg grating. So, we create a Bragg reflector. So, there is a waveguide and this is a Bragg reflector. So, this is again something we already um, studied in our basics right in the in the, in the in, in one of the lectures. So, this is going to reflect light and this is also going to trans transmit a certain amount of light. So, when you look at the light that is you know going through this is the transmission that you see you see a dip. So, this is our Bragg wavelength or the, the resonant wavelength here. So, this reflected or your Bragg wavelength strongly depends on the effective index right. So, any change in the effective index will result in shift here. So, what is effective index depend on this whole environment right. It depends on n 1, n 2, lambda and if this is the dimension d as well. So, all this is captured now. So, when you fix rest of the things all these are fixed now. But now, the, the surrounding refractive index we are going to change this. So, when there is a change in the uh, uh, refractive index of the environment your n effective is going to change right. So, the n effective change here would result in shift in this peak and based on the shift right between lambda b 1 minus lambda b let us say right if there is a positive shift then this will result in some delta lambda and this delta lambda is related to the delta n the change in the refractive index that we have in the environment. So, one can easily find out how, how much change in the refractive index we have around your optical device in this case Bragg simple Bragg. We will see um, uh, whether you need a resonant device like this like a Bragg. We can also have other kind of devices like a, a, a ring resonator that is what I am going to show you in the next couple of slides. So, the next way of, uh, uh, of doing the sensing is using absorption right. So, the molecules for example, the gas molecules um, they absorb a certain frequency right? this is coming from your the vibrating uh, molecules here. So, the molecules vibrate at certain frequency and when you have a, a, a light wave of, of, of uh, identical frequency these uh, molecules will absorb it 
right and when you have absorption then the amount of light that you get at the detector decreases right based on the absorption coefficient if this is the intensity so if there is a molecule if there is a, a wavelength so let's say this is lambda 1 and i send in another wavelength it will just pass through so the reason for this is um, your your wavelength here is not absorbed by the the gas that we have in the system right so this is how you can choose the right kind of wavelength for a certain gas. So, when uh, lambda 2 is not absorbed, then lambda 1 is absorbed. So, then we know what this lambda 1 absorption correspond to. How do we know that? So, this is from our fingerprint absorption because the molecules are very sensitive to these wavelengths. right? So, they do not absorb any wavelengths they want. These wavelengths are very specific. They will only absorb a certain wavelength of light or frequency of light because since this is a resonant absorption you can see here they are very specific absorption for example carbon dioxide absorbs at 4.2 micron here and then carbon monoxide here 4.66 micron so you can see here very distinct absorption band right so this is very characteristic of optical absorption spectrum. So, this is the reason why absorption sensing particularly when it comes to uh, you know optical absorption are very very selective they are very selective to the gas. So, when I when I see an absorption at 4.2 micron I do not have to you know confuse I know that there is carbon dioxide present in the system or present in the volume. So, if there is carbon dioxide inside the volume right then I would see the light getting absorbed at 4.2 micrometer if I want to know whether carbon dioxide is present. Similarly, I can do it for ammonia, I can do it for methane any kind of gas that you want you can find a fingerprint absorption here. So, this is all in long wavelength range as you can see here this happens primarily in mid infrared range right. So, this is absorption spectroscopy, but we can also do this um, you know in, in combinations we can do both refractive index and also absorption together in one single device. So, that is also a possibility where you use both these modes you know to firm up your data. So, you are not only looking at the absorption you are also looking at how much concentration you have and that concentration comes from this absorption. So, how much of light is getting absorbed for a particular length that you have right. So, that strongly depends on the concentration of light that you have and this is the dielectric constant. Okay. So, based on this let us look at um, uh, this two techniques that we have. So, one is refractive index sensing is primarily density sen sensing. So, in this case when we say density you have you have light propagating through uh, the waveguide and there is an environment right and I want to sense this environment and when you say sense the environment what are you trying to sense? I want to sense how dense the environment is right whether it is uh, tightly packed or loosely packed why would you do that? So, the primary reason um, to understand the density is to understand the concentration. So, when the concentration so we have two mixtures let us say right. So, you have uh, 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 a, a solvent and then you have some constituents there. So, when you increase the constituent right the solvent density is going to increase right. So, by understanding the environment you can say what is the concentration of this constituent present in the system. For example, I can take any chemical for example, I will say sulfuric acid for example. So, what is the dilution of this sulfuric acid? So, you mix sulfuric acid with water let us say or any kind of you know analyte for that matter or electrolyte for that matter. So, how do you measure this concentration? So, this is by understanding the density 
when you add sulfuric acid to water, so the refractive index of water is going to change. So, how much of sulfuric acid is present in this water? So, that can be measured by looking at the refractive index. Right? So, the refractive index is, is, is helping us in measuring the concentration or the density change. So, how, how can we measure this? So, we are going to look at our good old um, you know ring resonator here. So, this resonator um, this is something we already saw earlier even in our uh, communication discussion we looked at uh, this ring coming into play right. So, this is the fundamental equation here right. So, m lambda resonance equal 2 pi r m effective. So, when the when you put a broadband light source into the system then the light is going to propagate through the waveguide here and then it can couple into the ring here right. So, it will start you know circulating around this ring and then you can get the light out with this such a spectrum. So, you will see these are all resonant wavelengths right? what you call the drop resonances and what one could do is you take this ring. So, this is the surface here the light is propagating like this. So, this is the optical mode and this is the evanescent mode this is something that we know. What we are going to do is we are going to add some functional groups onto the sur 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 surface here. So, you see this is all functionalized surface that will attract a certain you know analyte species. So, you will have lot of analytes and uh, a particular species will come and sit on to this. When this particular um, uh, species bind onto the surface it will interact with this evanescent mode. Because of this binding you will have a refractive index change right because the material density around this point is now different right. So, we, we talked about you know N1 N2 and N3 right. So, now there is a local N3 variation and now if you look at the N effective around this point it is going to be different from the N effective that you have outside this region. So, wherever the molecules are sitting your ref refractive index is going to be different. So, when the refractive index changes your resonant wavelength will change. So, you can see here there is a shift in the resonance because of the analytes that we have on this sur surface. By looking at this delta lambda change because we do we do not know how much change we have right. So, we do not know what is delta n change how much refractive index change we have, but what we know is this delta lambda. So, we know this delta lambda and we can look at um, our effective index here or the resonance here from this equation we can back calculate what is the uh, density change that would result in this delta lambda shift all right. So, this is how we can use this very simple resonant device is this the only way to do it no <coughs> any device that has spectral response we can use for sensing. For example, you can use a, 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 a Max Zender interferometer as well for such application. So, you will have you have resonances or rather you know the, the phase shift as a function of lambda here, but now when you put an analyte here it is going to shift this peak ok. So, you can still use a simple Max Zender for doing sensing. So, all you need um, for sensing application is to have some spectral signature some spectral response uh, that depends on the refractive index right of the environment and when you have that uh, relation done then we should be able to do that. So, this is actually a, a, a fabricated device what you are seeing here right and their spectral response. Um, so, you have input a power. So, you have a broadband input here going through the ring right and then it couples in and it starts circulating and then a part of the light is taken out. So, what you see here is the directional coupler right. So, it is something that we already saw. So, based on the evanescent coupling light will be coupled in 
and some light will also leak through. So, this is called the through port or the transmission response right so, uh, that corresponds to the resonance that we have here right. So, we have very nice resonances coming out of the this particular drop port and this is exactly what we want. So, we have a clearly defined resonance here right. So, this is our lambda resonance. Now, the question is what happens if I expose it to a medium and as I mentioned you have a cladding right so that is surrounding here and that effective index depends on all the refractive index that we have n box is nothing but you know buried oxide layer in this case ok. So, when you have a thin film this is how it is going to be. So, since you have um, the top cladding influencing your refractive index change in the top cladding will affect our n effective. So, this is what would result in this shift in the resonance all right. So, make sure we understand this uh, clearly ok. So, this is our resonance condition. So, we are trying to change this n effective and because of the change in the n effective your resonance wavelength will shift and we are looking at a relative shift in the wavelength and based on this relative shift we can back calculate your change in the effective index right. So, you start with some index 1 let us say and if I change 1.03 that would result in an appropriate change in delta lambda. So, since we know the relation we only need to measure this delta lambda to back calculate what is the change in the index that I have all right. So, this particular technique that uh, I mentioned um, of measuring um, the change in the in the uh, in the response right by using this this kind of um, uh, receptors here the functional functional uh, groups sitting here um, and it will attract a particular type of analyte right and this is called label free sensing right. Why it is label free? Normally what happens in um, in optical sensing is if you want to sense a molecule we are going to attach a tag to this molecule right particularly happens in uh, microscopy. So, you want to trace a certain cell or certain virus or bacteria what they do is they attach a dye right. So, light emitting dye onto this uh, particular um, uh, 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 biomolecule that you have right and then when you eliminate it only those attached molecules are going to eliminate right. For that you know you have to tag it. So, you have to first functionalize this biomolecule with a receptor and this receptor should be you know very sensitive to only the biomolecule right that of interest you 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 do not want it to stick to all the cells and other uh, you know molecules that you have you, ha you have a sp specific target molecule. So, this uh, you know that the tag has to you know sit onto this or uh, latch onto this particular biomolecule and attract the dye right. So, the light emitting dye and this is called labeling right. So, when you label this then upon elimination only these labels are going to eliminate right. So, then you can count how many of this uh, you know interesting biomolecules are present in the uh, you know uh, uh, the biofluid that you are looking at or in the mass that you are looking at. In this case we are not doing any tagging at all. So, that is why we call it as label free we are not attaching label. So, uh, instead of label what are we doing? We are doing you know functional groups this is antigen antibody type uh, you know uh, conjugate. So, you make this uh, a specific uh, 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 you know receiver um, uh, molecules you know coated onto the substrate right. Then when you flow all these analytes on top of it only that specific binding will happen. For example, if you have a certain chemical configuration only that force or only those molecules that conjugate will attach to this binding molecule. So, the rest of the things will float around you can wash it off right. So, you can do a fluidics and then you can wash it off and by doing this 
you do not need to do any tagging, you do not need to do any labeling here and that is the reason why we call this technique label free biosensing. This is a very powerful and very easy technique. We do not have to think too much about you know whether you know, the, the tagging uh, will work and what is the, um, uh, the success rate or the affinity of your biomolecule to a particular tag and so on. Right. So, here it is a clear uh, uh, you know uh, a conjugate that you identify and then of course you need to do some biochemistry it is not just you search and get it. One need to look at the right biochemistry between these two molecules that you are looking at and if you get it right it, it, it works all the time the success rate is very high. Uh, what I mean by that is the selectivity is very specific. So, let us uh, look at the, the simple architecture here and when you have this uh, kind of architecture right what you, you have is uh, two ways of doing this kind of sensing right. One is by using uh, a tunable laser right. So, when you, when you have a tunable laser uh, very expensive tunable lasers right and you can use a photo detector. So, photo detectors are reasonably you know cheap but then the lasers are very expensive because you have to traverse through this whole wavelength range right. You have to sweep the wavelength right in order to find out the spectral response right. So, you have to have all these wavelengths available to you right. So, this is tunable laser um, which is very expensive right. But if you want to do any sensing kind of um, uh, work you want the sensors to operate at very minimal you know uh, overhead that means you do not want too expensive equipments to measure you know something very trivial right. Or when you are doing point of care uh, uh, use you do not want this um, uh, equipment to be very expensive in a remote place you do not have access to you know this kind of uh, equipments let us say. So, we can use broadband sources this is a LED source. They are uh, reasonably uh, cheap, um, uh, not very expensive like light sources, but you need a optical spectrum analyzer, right? So in one go, you have to filter out, right? So you this this broadband light source will give all the wavelengths that you want, which is good thing. In the laser, you only have one frequency here, right? Which will be tuned. But what we need uh, at the output end of this uh, uh, broadband source is a spectrum analyzer which is again very expensive. So, you either move your most expensive item from the input to the output right. So, you are you are not actually uh, benefiting from doing this right. So, ideally what you want is a combination of broadband source and a photo detector. This will be the most efficient option. Right. So, this is an ideal option to make a cost effective sensor characterization or sensor measurement right. The device remains the same right but it is impossible to do this the reason for that is photo detectors are you know lambda insensitive right. So, they, they will measure just the photon we do not know whether the photon is sitting at uh, 1550 or 1551. Okay. So, the, it will not differentiate it, it will just measure that you know I have a collective this much of photons, it will just give you a total current which is not you know something that we are looking for, we are looking for spectral shift right spectral characteristics. So, is there a way to solve this problem um, because for sensing we primarily look at, um, at uh, a very easy way you know um, inexpensive way of doing these measurements. Is, uh, is, is this combination going to work right. Um, a simple answer to this is just with this particular configuration it will not right. If we cannot do photo detector measurement with a broadband source right with this kind of spectrum. The reason for this is the spectral shift that we have right um, you can only notice it when you have a spectrum analyzer, but when you give it to the detector the total current right the total power remains constant right it will not change whether the wave uh, the whether the resonance is uh, here or here right so it, it it doesn't 
really matter right. Um, so, this puts a, a constraint here right. You cannot put this too um, uh, reasonably inexpensive source and detectors just with a single ring. We have to think a little bit more right to uh, come up with a strategy that could avoid this problem of uh, spectral measurement. So, this is the architecture one can think about instead of a single ring let us make a two ring configuration. So, in this two ring configuration the light is coupled. So, what you have is, is a very simple configuration of light being coupled here right a configuration like this. So, this is input the light is coupled into the system goes through this uh, let me yeah, goes through this and then it is coupled into this and it comes out. So, this is my output right. So, that is what we have here. So, we have a sensor ring and we have a filter ring first it goes through the filter ring ok and then whatever is filtered comes out to the sensor ring. So, what will be the output of a filter ring just look at it you have the input and you have a single ring and it comes out. So, basically what you are looking at is a this is your input and this is our output. So, how will it look like it is going to look like this this is what we saw earlier right. So, this is what you will get from the first ring all right and it will go to the second ring right. So, the second ring will also have the same response right the second ring also you have the input and then the light is going to come back. So, the spectral characteristics of the second ring will be all also like this. Here we want this filter ring and your um, uh, the sensor ring to, uh, to be identical right. So, you want identical sensor ring and your filter ring. So, for example, you will have same radius right R 1 uh, let us say R, R filter equals to R sensor right you want to have this. So, that they are overlapping resonances. So, now what you are trying to do is instead of having a broadband source given as input to the sensor you are already providing a, a filtered comb like input to our sensor ring. So, now when it goes through it right uh, you can put it to a, a photo detector now all right. So, the photo detector current will change as a function of refractive index here ok. So, how is the photo detector current changes as a function of refractive index. So, let us look at that a little bit more carefully here. So, we have filter ring and then we have sensor ring. So, both are having same resonances right. So, they should have same resonance like this. So, now imagine that the sensor ring is put with some analyte here. So, that means you will have some delta n change right the resonance is going to now change, but your filter ring is fixed we are not doing anything to this right this is fixed. So, that means your response this is transmission let us say this is lambda your transmission is not going to change for the filter ring. However, for the sensor ring the response is going to change. So, now they do not align anymore. So, now if they do not align anymore look at the output current that it will produce. So, when they are on top of each other all the light from the filter or the fixed ring will go through the sensor and or you will have maximum light. So, when the sensor ring starts moving the overlap is reduced and when the overlap is reduced the current that you measure also goes down all right. So, this is how you can convert spectral information into just a very simple current measurement ok. So, you can um, visualize this by using you know two combs right. So, 
uh, first we have uh, comb 1 okay. So, that has uh, the filter response and there is a one more comb right. So, if you take these two combs right so since I have a blue background it will be much easier. So, now let us say we have you know such a such a comb here right. So, all the light right is now passing through right. So, we do not have any problem in visualizing it. So, there is lot of light going through right. So, when they are aligned. So, now imagine that one of the filter is fixed the other filter is moving now. Now can you see any light through this? The light is now reduced right through the through my fingers the, the, the blue screen behind me you cannot see it right uh, through the fingers here. So, it is completely blocked that is because one of the ring has moved. So, now this movement of one you know against the other changes the light that can pass through right and this is exactly we are doing. So, we are taking one ring that has fixed the response the other ring which is the sensor ring we are moving it on top. So, this movement we can clearly calculate how much power change that you will have for a certain delta lambda change. So, the optical power is now related to delta lambda this is our goal if you remember we want to have a broadband source and we just want to have one photo detector. So, photo detector will only measure power since you have single ring moving you know up and down the total power remains the same, but now I have put two rings right. So, they are going to change the amount of power that is going through and I just need a photo detector in order to measure this power all right. So, now we have a, a very good solution of having a very simple um, you know broadband light source right it is an LED source and then put a, a photo detector and in the photo detector we are going to just measure the current and this current change is a function of the analyte or the refractive index change on it. So, this is this is a very um, you know neat way of um, doing very efficient um, uh, sensing. So, we will try to see if um, this one runs. So, this is a simulation of, uh, of such an architecture right. Um, I will show you how the actual measurement uh, would look like in the next slide, but this is just for you to understand how the how it should work whatever I explain this is simulated here right. So, you have the sensor ring and you have the filter ring right and um, what you see in uh, red here this is the overlap right. So, overlap between this. So, right now you can you can see here and the bottom one shows the um, what is the total light intensity change as a function of you know effective uh, refractive index ok. What is the refractive index change? So, so you can see here the sensor or the filter in this case is moving one or the other it can be anything. So, when it is moving you can see that the power is going down right from high and then once it reaches closer the power is becoming higher right. So, that is what is happening here and here again it is traced right. So, whatever the, the red curve that we had so you can see here it is going up and down right as a function of refractive index change. So, by using um, this particular technique you can measure the refractive index by just measuring the power right for a certain power this much is the refractive index change for this much power change what I have right. So, this this particular technique gives us um, a very uh, interesting way of measuring just the power in order to measure the index change. Let us look at um, the actual measurement this is um, a real experimental measure, uh, measurement that you can see where you have the filter ring and you have the sensor ring. So, one is you know energized and one is moved against the other ok. So, you can see here the spectrum is getting bigger and then smaller. 
right. So, this is all happening because of the overlap between this. So, now it will again come up when you have a good overlap between the sensor ring and the filter ring and then it will go down. So, I will play it again you can see here good overlap best overlap and then you are out right and then again it will come back because this is a you know uh, a periodic function right. So, again you can see here a good overlap and then going down and this is again coming from this particular plot here. So, it is going down and then it is coming up again right. So, it is high low and high. So, this this is what we actually measure here right. So, it is now coming closer they are identical and now it is dying. So, this technique gives us um, a clear way of measuring density changes not by looking at the spectrum right. So, traditionally we only looked at the spectrum. But now, instead of looking at the spectrum using a very expensive uh, spectrum analyzer, we can just use a photodiode and all we need to do is measure the photo current. So, by measuring the photo current whether it is high or low and you trace that slope and based on the power you know that how much uh, density change has happened. So, with that we, we have an understanding of how density change could be measured. Uh, but in the following lecture, let us look at how we can measure uh, both you know absorption and uh, 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 density change together. So, uh, that is again an evolution of whatever we are discussing uh, now to see how we can improvise this to make it a little bit more interesting. Thank you very much for listening.